And that was the first time that I tried to actually say, what do you think about not separating from your wife? Like, what if you really try to work on this? I'm engaging in a relationship with a man who, the way he described it, is in a contractual agreement, but was not in, like, an emotional relationship with somebody. In general, people distance themselves from criminals they've been involved with. They do this to avoid internal feelings of guilt. This video is about Nicole's self-protective statements, no matter if these statements are intentional or unintentional on her part. Linguistic self-defense, as I call it, is common in these situations. I've focused on self-protective statements in previous videos, but not in relation to this brand new footage. Apart from just what's case, what you're about to see can be used to decode conversations in your own lives and bring out hidden truths. For more comprehensive explanations of some of the methods, check this video. And for videos about how to make good arguments and identify bad arguments, check these two. Links are in the description box below. One last thing before I start. It's important to me to state that this video is not about suspicions, rumors, or reopening the case by any stretch of the imagination. It's about observable speech patterns related to linguistic self-defense. It's unrelated to the crime. This analytical focus is in accordance with the family's wish as well, and I intend to respect their wish. That information, when you look backwards, um, in your memory with the conversations with Chris, anything that he might have said that would be relative to that, and I'm not just, you know, even if he, one day he was mad and he said, I want to do this or do that, um, you know, anything like that. If he ever made any kind of statements that you were like, whoa, that was weird, um, or why would he say that, or why did he mention that? Do you understand what I'm, I'm no, looking I for? No, I completely understand. I just feel like some of this happened so long ago that I can't tell you like the exact words of the exact conversation at the exact time sure. and place because it's like we had a lot of conversations i mean we talked every single day so it's so if there's like a i'm trying to help you guys with the stuff like the stuff that's more current i can give you guys a lot more like detail and exact times but when you're asking me about something that happened six weeks ago and exactly what was said it's like i mean i'm sure i can give you a general idea but to be honest with you like to pinpoint exact words it's not gonna happen i'm not Looking for exact words. She says she can't tell the exact words, the exact conversation. She's the one who introduced the word exact. Linguistically, from Nicole's point of view, this supposed limited knowledge helps protect her from further questioning. Often, too many details fall back on the subject. She emphasizes it's not gonna happen, which is a strong stance before the questioning even begins. She associates with the detectives, making this sound like a shared effort. To avoid guilt by association, it's common for subjects to initially state that they won't be able to remember much in case they were intimidated by the questions. But as we'll see later on, Nicole remembers quite a bit. Saying she's honest tells us that she's very aware of the other people in the room, since honesty is presupposed in conversations we rarely need to say that we're being honest. The words, to be honest and honestly, form a pattern in Nicole's language. What did that cause you to do with your phone, though? Oh, what, when I deleted those? I was just kind of grossed out by him, to be honest with you. I was just like, I don't know what's going on right now, but you just lied to me, and I don't want to see this come over my phone anymore. So I removed it. So even though no one's expressed doubt about her explanation, She's using language that's aimed at convincing. This demonstrates a high level of linguistic self-defense. So during June and July, did you, were you aware that he, uh, his family was not, his, did you meet his children? The detectives asked a short question, but Nicole gives a long answer. Nope. During June to. and July. And he didn't ask me to. Okay. I mean, not that I didn't want to ever. It was just not now. It's like you're not finalized with your separation and not only that we've barely been dating like you can't introduce kids to somebody new in a situation like that that's something that takes time I mean would I have liked to have met them of course they you know I mean that would have been 
a, a great honor for me to have somebody introduce their children into my life, you know, and, and but not then. It was something that it was like, okay, well, let's see where we're at in six months, let's see where we're at in a year, and if we're still doing this, and you and me are still, you know, happy with where we're at, and you think that this is something that is going to be long-term and is worth bringing your children into the picture, then yes, I would love to meet them, but it's like, not right now. You are still in this situation where you're, you're not even completely out of it, and I'm getting in it, and that's not fair for them. And that was kind of the policy that I had with him, was it was just like, yes, but not yet. Her answer contained self-praise, even though the question didn't call for this. Unmotivated self-praise suggests that the subject's trying to present themselves in the best light possible. In Nicole's narrative, she comes across as a moral and responsible person, unlike Chris. Her talking points mimic the ones of the general public, rather than someone who was actually a part of this relationship. She even says she had a policy. And we were there not very long, but that time I saw a picture of his wife and one of his kids. And I remember thinking to myself, like, wow, she's so beautiful. And I like took a step back and I was just like, this man has a gorgeous house. He has beautiful babies. He has a beautiful wife. He has an awesome job. Like, why would he want to leave this? And I remember talking to him about it. And that was the first time that I tried to actually say, what do you think about not separating from your wife? Like, what if you really try to work on this? And he had expressed to me that we've tried to work on this and it's not working. So that is why we're separating. She portrays herself as someone who tried to save Chris's marriage. The details she gives also anticipate the objections that the general public has to her actions. So there's a self-serving purpose to her recollection. Let's see the last part one more time. And he had expressed to me that we've tried to work on this and it's not working, so that is why we're separating. She's practically quoting Chris which suggests that her statement in the beginning that she wouldn't remember exact words and exact conversations was an act of self-defense, because she seems to remember almost perfectly. If you like the video, support the channel by subscribing. Close to 80% of this channel's watch time is from non-subscribers. Subscribing helps the channel grow, as more people will know about it. You can also help by sharing the videos. And I spent some time, like, just, you know, kind of, because it, it almost made me feel bad, where I was, like, to the point where I'm engaging in a relationship with a man who, the way he described it, is in a contractual agreement, but was not in, like, an emotional relationship with somebody. The basic premise of language analysis is that people inadvertently or unwillingly tell the truth about what they think or feel the real truth, what they really think and feel. So when she uses the adverb almost, and it almost made me feel bad, I believe her. The adverb restricts the level of feeling bad. This way of phrasing the possible guilt she has about this relationship gives us a small insight into what she's moved by, or almost moved by. I'm engaging in a relationship with a man who, the way he described it is, in a contractual agreement, but was not in like an emotional relationship with somebody. In a subtle way, she makes Chris responsible for the definition of the affair the two were having. Also, she obviously has a clear recollection of how he described it. So once again, she's very specific. Um, and for me, the way I would have preferred to do this is to avoid it till that contractual agreement was also done and he was done and he could have approached me and said, I'm just had a divorce, you know, maybe we could take this slow. What do you think? Nicole makes it sound like she wanted a different arrangement with Chris than the one he described. But next we hear her admitting that she didn't wait for him to get a divorce. But instead it was, oh, we're separated and we're working on a divorce. And that is the part that I feel bad about because I should have waited on that, and I didn't. Later on, she repeats that she urged him to try to get his marriage to work. Backed away so we weren't hanging out quite as much, and we were still close, but it was just 
Like, I really wanted him to try. Like, I wanted to know that he tried and it didn't work, and then he moved on. Not, not that, you know, they both kind of tried, and then he got himself into a situation with somebody else. And I don't know. I just thought he had a beautiful life going on, and he could have made it work. You said this This doesn't look right. He's kind of, um, I don't want to be responsible for breaking up a marriage, especially with two children. Is that kind of the gist I'm getting here? I didn't think it didn't look right. I mean, I, I think he was legitimately sleeping in the basement, and I don't, I didn't think that these two were, I mean, I think it was like, hey, we're both stuck in this house for now. we got to sell this. It just seemed like he had so much going on. And it was just beautiful that I was like, why don't you just try this out, you know, and see if you can fix it. And he'd always be like, well, what about us? What about us? I'm like, don't worry about us. Like, that is more important. Like, try to see if you can, like, salvage whatever it is that you have going on with your wife. In light of this, it's understandable that the detective asks if she reflected on her actions then or if she reflects on them now. That was the way I looked at it from the outside. So is this something you reflected on since this event or was this... You No, I was doing it then. Like you Was she really as reasonable at the time as she would like to be perceived? From a detective's point of view, Nicole's reflections could be afterthoughts, present-day reflections tailored to this interview. And that is the part that I feel bad about because I should have waited on that and I didn't. Previously, Nicole said she almost felt bad. And now she says that this is the part she feels bad about. She restricts her experience. When you limit your guilt to a certain part you feel bad about, you implicitly state that there are bigger parts that you don't or shouldn't feel bad about. I'm still in shock that this whole thing happened. I like, can I... imagine. So remember what you just said, and we're going to get to that, because that's probably a very important yeah. conversation. So if you want to know so, days, I would probably honestly just start it like Sunday and work your way forward. I mean, all the rest of that stuff, it's just like the small talk of like, hey, this, 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 you know? I mean... And your relationship building through the... Yeah, weeks. I mean, like, and if you go like a, maybe like a week further back, like there's times like I was trying to help him find an apartment, like just for him, not for me, but for him and his kids. We hear an unprovoked, distancing, and self-protective statement. Like, just for him, not for me. Her answer focuses on her, her thoughts, and her good intentions. Um, to get set up, and like, there's times where I'm like, well, where's your wife moving to? Like, how close is she going to be to you? You should be within like 30 minutes of your kids, so they're close, and like, you want to be close to their school and close to your gym and like what's your price range like i was helping him get all of this stuff set up and it was like in a very decent manner and i don't know if all of that is in text some of it's probably on the phone like at this point i've talked to him so much that i don't even know which parts are like verbalized <laughs> and which parts are texted at right. this point but we can figure it out okay she says it was all in a very decent manner this is interesting because why bring up the word decent unless there was something indecent about this situation. Either Nicole knows that she's been indecent too, being in this relationship, or she knows that this situation is indecent in the eyes of the general public. So again, she's countering objections, and she inadvertently points to the opposite of decent. She doesn't say, but you can figure it out, leaving it up to the detectives. Instead, she uses the collective pronoun we, Implicitly, she gives the detectives a hint that some of the texts won't be simple and or innocent looking. Let's go back to North Carolina. Okay. He went to North Carolina and he was trying to rehab his marriage with his wife. Uh, he said do you, do you he know her name at this point? Yeah. Okay. Are you okay saying her name? Mm, it's Shanann. All right. They're they were visiting her family for the most part until... He got there. So he goes there. How, do you, you said it was like the last week of July? I think so. I think it was like one of the last days of July. I'm almost positive. I think it was a weekday. Okay. Um, yeah, he flew out there. And then I was like, if you guys work on this, like, I'm out. Because what's the point? Like, I'm not trying to be with somebody that's in another relationship, which I know that sounds silly given the whole relationship that we had in the first place. But... I really was under the impression that they were separating. 
She continues her narrative as the responsible part of this relationship and as someone who was deceived by Chris, just like his wife. It's interesting that she says she knows it sounds silly, considering the relationship she and Chris had in the first place. This indicates that she might not consider herself to have been as rational or responsible as she would like to be perceived. The word silly is quite different from being responsible. Also, by associating with what the general public would say, she anticipates objections. Anticipating objections involves mimicking what someone else would say or feel. When a subject anticipates an objection, they reveal that they know the difference between right and wrong actions. She uses vivid language in form of direct quotes to make her points. This kind of language has the ability to draw the hearer into the narrative and underline the supposed truthfulness of it. However, we can't fact-check Nicole's conversations with Chris, so vivid language isn't necessarily accurate. He could pretty much call me whenever he wanted. Like, I was the one that would tell him, like, hey, when your kids are awake, you need to spend time with your kids. Like, do that. Sometimes, like, right after work, if I was, like, still talking to him, I'd get kind of bummed out. And, I, you know, I'd tell him, I'm just like, oh, it's frustrating sometimes, like, having to, like, wait. But at the same time, I was never like, this is horrible or, you know, it was always like, I just said, why? So it kind of made sense. It wasn't like... And you guys were just texting and... Or talking or whatever, uh, you know. I mean, and it was just, it was like I said, it was at certain times, but that time, and originally it wasn't, but it was me that put that time frame on there because I thought he should hang out with his kids. Um, Those two times you were at his house, did you see any evidence of that, him living in the basement? Did he ever show you that area or anything? I've seen it, yeah. I went down there and saw his, his little workout equipment, and there's a bed down there all set up, and the basement was all clean and organized and stuff. So, I don't know what you're talking about. North Carolina. Let's, yeah, go, go back to North so, Carolina. So, North Carolina. Um, so, he still made very frequent communication with me when he was out there, and at one point he told me that they sat down, and they talked about it, and he told her that he wanted to either fix things or, like, to try to fix things. And if she didn't want to fix them, then they needed to, like, move forward with the separation and, like, actually file for a divorce at this point was, was the impression that I got from this and was what he told me. And so, um... She says... He still made very frequent communication with me when he was out there. Chris is the grammatical subject here. Nicole doesn't include herself by saying we communicated. She also says was was the impression that I got from this and was what he told me and so linguistically this makes her a spectator as if she only had and only has the information that Chris told her. Even though this might be true, it's interesting to observe this linguistic self defense. I don't even know what days these were. Sometime when he was out there, he told me um we're putting the house up for sale as soon as we get back. And I was like, well, that was quick. And he was like, it's her, she's ready to go. And I was like, okay. He got back and I started asking him like, what are you gonna do? Because the Colorado housing market is fire and you guys are gonna sell this house like real fast. And I'm like, you need to start looking for a new place to live. And I'm like, where do you wanna live? And I was really trying to help him out. I'm like, do you wanna get a house? And he told me why well, I, I like Brighton. And I was like, okay. And then he told me he wanted a two bedroom apartment and he said he wanted one room for him and the other room for his two girls. And I thought it was kind of cute. Like I remember telling him, I was like, yeah, me and my sister had bunk beds. Like, and it was really exciting. Like I liked helping him and I just wanted him to like, I don't know. This is what he told me he wanted. So I was like, well, I will help you do the research. But another thing that I really took care of was to be like, where is she moving to? I was never like, you know what, screw your wife, try to get full custody, none of that. She seems to remember exact words that reiterate her role as the helper. She displays the linguistic traits of someone with a guilty conscience, feeling guilty about this relationship. Because obviously, associating with the general public is sensitive to her. Here, she mimics the outrage of the general public by sounding offended. I was never like, you know what, your wife, try to get a full custody, none of that. Implicitly, she shows that she knows what the general public thinks about her actions and that she thinks the public's wrong about the nature of her motivations. 
She literally hammers this point. Where is she moving to? So he, at this time, is telling you that, yeah, I am the guy trying to save the marriage and she doesn't want it. That's what he told me. That's what he told me. So, okay. um, and he, yeah. And then he was like, she doesn't want it, so I'm not going to do it. And then it was like, we're filing for divorce, we're selling the house. And this was like all as soon as they were coming back from North Carolina, like boom, 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 boom. And so I took the time, and you will see that in the text too, where I like, like there, like I found this apartment. It was perfect. It was so cute. I was like, it's in your price range. It's like six miles from the gym. It's 23 miles from work. I'm like, you know, it's super close to Frederick. It's going to be by your kid's school. Like this is this is the spot. Phonetically, Nicole emphasizes that she took the time to help Chris. It's also a syntactic emphasis since she places the sentence first in her statement. The second most important thing to Nicole, evidently, is to provide backing for this claim, that the detectives will be able to validate her claim by looking at the text messages. So obviously and understandably, the phone data is very sensitive to her. She spends much time explaining the text messages beforehand. No. So there, the, the way you guys were trying to make this work was just you know, slowly trying to come together because of his current situation and you, by your own account, your own... Mine! I mean, you're I you're just a, a independent person, it sounds like, pretty much. Yeah. And uh, But through text message or through conversation, he never said, hey, uh, you know, this isn't going to be financially able, I'm not going to be financially able to do this, or this isn't a good thing, I, I got these kids. N none of those conversations ever came up. No. I mean, he told me, like, he had a budget restriction. So for his apartment, and I'm pretty sure this is in the text, and this will probably be in the last couple of weeks, um, he told me 1100 to 1400 when I was asking him. Like, because I told him I'd help him do homework. I was like, you do some homework, I'll do some homework. We'll knock this out because if you guys are for real putting the house up, you got to figure it out. That was his budget. And I remember asking him, I was like, you sure you don't want to just get, like, a house? And he's like, I never thought about a house. I'm like, yeah, you can rent houses, man. Like, it's a thing. And he's just like, I don't know if I can afford that. And I was like, okay. And I knew that those two had been through some financial trouble. I definitely found out a lot more about that situation in the newspaper recently. Um, her alleged role as a motherly figure to Chris continues in her narrative. She says she helped Chris do homework. The question is, what's linguistically important to Nicole? It's important to her to emphasize that she was helping him, but from a distance. She's not talking about an apartment or a house for the two of them, but only for Chris. You said earlier that he had never, um, or that the, the apartment wasn't for you and him. It was just for him and his children? Oh, yes. It was, you weren't in, had no intentions of moving I, in with him? No. I have my own spot. I still have a lease there till July. And even then, like, he never asked me to move in with him. Okay. And... I never tried to move in with him. I mean, I told him, I mean, I really try to take everything with this whole situation very slow. The only part that I screwed up on was the fact that he wasn't completely separated from her when him and I decided to spend time with each other. That is where I screwed up. But other than that, everything else, it was always like, you know, you build your life, I'm going to build my life, we will intertwine them, but I am not ready to like do this and he respected that we hear the restriction the only part that i screwed up on followed by another that is where i screwed up with vowel stress on that indicating that this syntactically is the key word we then get a third restriction starting with the conjunction but but other than that everything else it was always like this conjunction minimizes the preceding statement about screwing up Instead, she emphasizes that she wanted the two of them to build separate lives. She underlines a distance between them rather than a connection. With this restriction, she again associates with the general public, the side of good, so to speak. Yeah, and I, and I, um, I even said that, and I don't know if that might be in the text, but said so that two words like Chris, like, 
you need space. Like, you're just getting out of a divorce. Like, personally, I think jumping into a new relationship is a little quick. It's like, I was in a relationship earlier this year, and I think this is also a little quick. And I'm like, so why don't we take our time? And I'm like, if you guys end up doing a week on, a week off with your kids, I'm like, the week you have your kids, be with your children. And the week that you don't, I'm like, I don't even want to see you every day. She uses direct quotes, drawing us into her narrative, which contains self-praise. Chris doesn't appear to have much say in anything in this narrative. I don't even want to see you every day is a rejection of him. And I and we talk about things every once in a while where, I, you know, I'd be like, hey, if I ever meet, you know, because like I have a lot of house plants. That's a good example. So I have a lot of house plants and I told I told him I was like, one day, if I ever meet your kids, I was like, I'm going to show these girls how to like paint pottery and plants plants. I was like, I think they would love to see something grow that they built. I think it would be really, really cute. And like little stuff like that, but it wasn't very frequent. It wasn't, hey, we should get married and hey, we should have babies and hey, I want to live with you and hey, I need to meet your children now and let's cut the mom out. It was never like and that. that was Here, she counters almost everything that the general public or the detectives would otherwise accuse her of. Hey, we should get married and hey, we should have babies and hey, I want to live with you and hey, I need to meet your children now and let's cut the mom out. Implicitly, Nicole reveals that she knows what's right and what's wrong. And she says this unprovoked, so this is obviously sensitive to her. It sounds like she's almost lost in her story about plants and pottery, but she's always self-aware enough to restrict her stories. But it wasn't very frequent. As she says. Syntactically, she makes this sentence the most important one. The use of the conjunction but makes it the linguistic focus. I but mean, this one, you were a little bit more, you said he's with two women. Did that, was that one of your considerations for not telling anybody about him? Yes, well, I mean, it was like, okay, like this, to me, it wasn't going to be an ex extended thing. Like, if it got to the point where we were, like, dating for, like, three or four months and he's still talking about, oh, I'm going to move out, I'm going to sell the house, I think at that point I probably would have just been like, I don't think you're really, like, doing these things you say you're going to do. And I probably would have just, like, left because at that point it's not fair. It wasn't fair to me in the first place. It wasn't fair to her in the first place. It wasn't fair to any of us in the first place. You know, it wasn't fair to his family for him to have an affair. It wasn't fair to me. There's a mismatch between question and answer. Nicole was asked in past tense about a particular reason for not telling anybody about Chris. She starts with agreeing, but then modifies her response with the hedge I mean, which signals probability, not certainty. Yes, well, I mean, it was like, okay, like this. She continues weakening her assessment with the following conditional clause suggesting something hypothetical. If it got to the point where we were... This weakening of her statement continues with the hitches I think and probably, which is repeated twice. I think at that point I probably would have just been like, and I probably would have just like... Before the modal verb would have... At that point... At that point, linguistically moves the goalpost, underlining the hypothetical nature of a statement. Aside from just this interview, Weak modifiers and expressions of uncertainty are known as equivocation. Equivocation means not fully committing to the question. Linguistically, it allows the subject to modify the statement at a later point without directly contradicting anything they said. I don't think you're really, like, doing these things you say you're going to do. These aren't real quotes. It's fictional dialogue. However, Nicole's successive use of this kind of vivid language shows us that she's aware of what she should have said to Chris according to societal norms. I don't even know anymore what is real and what is not. But what I do know is it's just like, you know, that wasn't fair to me either because if I'd have known not even all the truth, but like obviously some of it, I wouldn't have even engaged in any of this in the first place. And it just, I mean, and that's the part for me, just like on my personal level, outside of everything that is happening, that is going to affect me long term. It's like, you know, I'm going to wake up every day and know that like this mom and her unborn child and these two little girls are not around anymore. And it breaks my heart. It is so, oh my God. And, and 
And then I have to think about like the consequences of his actions and how they affect everybody else. Like to engage in something presupposes that there is something to participate in in the first place. She doesn't say started or another verb that would indicate more activity on her part. Any of this is unspecified. She avoids saying affair or another specific word, and she's again distancing herself from personal decisions. She continues pointing to Chris, his actions and how they affect everybody else. She says this mom, which is distancing language. I didn't know. Like I, I, ugh. It's, he's so disgusting, I'm so ashamed of him and everything, and I just... She takes on the role of the general public by calling Chris disgusting, and she says this unprovoked, which doubles the sensitivity of these statements. She uses dramatization to counter possible objections. There's resolution. Absolutely. That's why we come to you guys to yeah. pound this. And pound it down. Hey, until I, there's I'm nothing left. sorry that you're talking again today. I really am. I don't want to put you through any more trauma than you've already been through. I still cannot believe this is happening. Alright, let's keep going because we're just let's, getting let's, to the, like, the meat of this let's, whole situation. Let's get to the phone call on Saturday from 9 to 11. I think so. I need to think. I can't even think. Take a couple breaths and take a, take a second. Um, you know what? <clears throat> I still don't remember what we talked about. I, like, honestly, like, we talk about so much random stuff. Like, it's so hard to pinpoint some of these things. Um, I don't remember what we talked about. I do remember that was a long phone conversation, though. We probably talked about all sorts of stuff. Um, one thing I do remember, though... Um, but I didn't remember earlier when I was talking to Mark. So this is like where I'm starting to remember like little bits and pieces. And I, I don't remember. Yeah, I know. The, so the phone conversation, I don't remember what was in the phone conversation. Probably nothing of relevance to be honest with you. But um, usually he talks to me when he's like down in the basement in his bed before he goes to bed and before I go to bed. She's equivocating and regardless of intention, Equivocation gives leeway to modify statements at a later point in case the subject suddenly does remember something they were concerned about. Yeah, so no TV in the basement where he usually calls you from? Yeah, and I don't know how many TVs they have. Like, I've never been in their bedroom. Like, I went upstairs once and it was like to their little playroom and I just like looked at it and I was like, that's super cute that your girls have books and that was like it. And other than that, I have never been in any of those rooms in that upstairs. Like, to me, it was just like, you don't no like ever i had no so i don't know if he has any other tvs i'm assuming by like how much other nice stuff they have in their house it wouldn't surprise me so i'm not quite sure what room he was in at that point she wasn't asked about the bedroom but still she says she went upstairs once obviously emphasizing her lack of time spent in the home is sensitive to her indirectly she states that she had certain moral concerns when a subject mentions the exact number of times they did a particular thing, statement analysis says to take note of it. It could mean that the number of times is sensitive to the subject for whatever reason. This channel contains many videos where you can learn about linguistic analysis. Check the links in the description box below. If you're watching this video, subscribe and ring the notification bell. See you in the next video. So do you think if he found out that you, um, if, let's say this week you guys were to go look at some apartments, and this is hypothetical, you're not going to, I got divorced from my wife. You Wait. said, do you understand what I'm saying here? If, if she's gone. But this. Don't lead. Hypothetically. Please. Don't hypothetically. Lead on. If she, okay. you understand where I'm going. If right, you didn't you're, know. You're leading into right. questions that are but, nothing with your. If you didn't know, though. Wait, Nick. That she was there. Did you hear what I said? 